in any kind of assault, and this, I look at this as a diplomatic or political assault, which in many, many ways can be compared to a military assault. Some people call it third generation warfare. After the first generation was the conventional invasion of 48. Then we had the mass terrorism. Now we're faced with the political attempt to wipe Israel off the map. In order to understand that, you also you need to have an understanding of the types of tactics and strategies that one needs, and I think DJ presented that very well and Dan put it in a broader framework. What I'm going to do is try to explain how the other side's army functions. What are their battle tanks, what are their aircraft, or the political equivalents thereof, and how do we deal with those? What are the best strategies to, to intercept and interdict them? I start with actually some good news, because I think this is the kind of language that we need. We need to hear it. I see the Canadians here, and I should have also put the quotes in from Canadian officials, including the Prime Minister. But I think it certainly resonated very clearly in President Obama's APAC conference when he stood very, very strongly and directly in condemning efforts to delegitimize the state of Israel. And efforts to chip away will, not be, will be met by unshakable opposition in the United States, and specifically he illustrated that with his first decision as, as president dealing with the Middle East, practically his first decision, which was publicly to announce that Israel is not going, this was in 2009, to the 2009 Durban Review Conference, and the United States has also said it's not going to the third Durban Conference, and also, as President Obama said, that he stood strongly, his administration stood strongly in the wake of the Goldstone Report, essentially refuting its uh, recommendations, standing up strongly for Israel's right to defend itself. That is, a, I think, a very important example of the type of opposition from President Obama that's necessary to deal with the delegitimization or the assault, the political assault. And now I'm going to take a step back. That was all the good news I have to say. Now we're going to go to the bad news. To understand the process, I could actually start in the 1920s or 1947-48, the rejection of the partition resolution saying we don't want, we will never recognize the legitimacy of Jewish national self-determination. But I'm going to jump quickly through the 75 resolution on Zionism as racism to its current embodiment, which was the 2001 Durban NGO Forum. Erwin Kotler is here, there may be others who are representatives there, 1,500 NGOs, at least 5,000 delegates, marching Zionism as racism, making that connection between Israel and, or trying to make that connection between Israel and apartheid South Africa. And the major thrust of their declaration, which was essentially written in Tehran, under UN auspices in what was called a, uh, a, a PREPCOM, a preparatory conference that took place before. In just these three short paragraphs, you see how many times words like apartheid, racist, ethnic cleansing are used. That is the origin of the BDS movement. That is the origin of the delegitimization process. This was adopted by 1,500 organizations that claim to promote human rights including what are often called the, the Watchdogs Human Rights Watch, which is based in the United States, roughly 40 or $50 million annual budget, and Amnesty International based in London. They were a major part of this Durban NGO conference. They adopted this resolution, and they and their many partners are the ones that are promoting it in what's called civil society, through the media, in parliaments, in Geneva and the United Nations frameworks. That is, to me, those are the, the weapons that we have to deal with. Just a few months ago, we had another assault from Human Rights Watch out of New York, a, uh, an op-ed piece and a, a, a long, I think, 120-page report, which only focused on labeling Israel as a racist and apartheid state. That is exactly antithesis of the morality of human rights. The Durban strategies have been implemented continuously since then in, in applying that international isolation through the abuse of terms like war crimes or accusations of violations of international law. Sometimes we hear the term collective punishment, which has a, a Nazi type of ring to it vis-a-vis -vis Gaza. Uh, and, and in lawfare cases, we saw it in Janine with the massacre myth that was used. Also, the first public statement on that that was not done by a Palestinian official was on the BBC by a, an amnesty official. Of course, we know that the massacre claim was entirely fabricated. It went through the apartheid wall case in the, in the UN. It went through the Goldstone Report, Beit Hanun, uh, and I, I could spend just uh, more than 10 minutes going through all the details. And of course, more recently, the Goldstone Report and the flotilla. It goes from the NGOs through the media to the diplomatic community, 
the United Nations Human Rights Council, dominated by the Organization of the Islamic Conference until recently with chairs like Iran and Syria and Libya, and then it goes into the form of academic theses and, and books. The Goldstone process is perhaps, the, the, is certainly the greatest uh, uh, visibility for that process, where most of the report was simply based on cut and paste of NGO claims, most of which are either unverifiable or later turned out to be demonstrably false, but that's what was used repeatedly on campuses around the world. Israel Apartheid Week, the, uh, the various types of demonstrations, excuse for excluding uh, Israeli students from classes, calling them war criminals. The fact that uh, Judge Goldstone took him about a year and a half recognizing that he was taken in by this process, he didn't quite say it clearly, but he said it clearly enough, has retracted a lot of what he said and has since remained silent, I think, says a lot about how this process works. Now this has got a lot of money behind it. I'm just gonna show you some illustrations and then talk about where the money comes from. Both of these posters are funded by European governments. There are many other examples. This was promotes incitement, anti-Semitism, and hatred. The one on your, I don't know which side you're looking at from here, but the one that has the, uh, the yellow Badil poster, the one on the left, is uh, funded, as I said, by a number of European governments, and you can see the classic anti-Semitic themes. Badil, as you see on the sheet, is uh, one of the major NGOs. It's called the Resource Center for Palestinian Res Residency and Refugee Rights. When governments give to Badil, and many of them do, including Switzerland, Denmark, uh, Holland and others, and they're not transparent, so we don't know all the details. They're giving them ostensibly to promote refugee rights. But in fact, what you see is this and many other similar campaigns. They are active, extremely active in delegitimization. The poster on the right from an organization called Mada al Carmel, actually there were three Israeli Palestinian organizations, also largely funded by European governments and until about two years ago also by the government of Canada, ostensibly for promoting women's rights and equality in the Israeli Arab community, but in fact using the theme of charging Israelis with rape and sexual assault as part of a propaganda delegitimization campaign. As I said, I can present many other examples of that uh, in, in this process. The, the bulk of the funding comes from European governments, and that's one of the reasons I'm speaking to you. European governments, in most cases, without parliamentary supervision, in most cases, there, is, there are no hearings. European Union Parliament, European Parliament does not hold hearings. Only a few days ago, the Dutch Parliament held its first hearing on the subject. The, in each one of these governments, including governments that are not in the European Union, like Switzerland and Norway, there are multiple mechanisms for funding these organizations almost entirely in secret. There is no due process, there are no protocols, there are no public debates. Why are these governments funding the organizations listed on the sheets here? And we have never received adequate responses. The European taxpayers don't get adequate responses. The Israeli public that's affected by this type of campaign doesn't have adequate responses. Electronic Intifada is found to be funded secretly by a church group called ICO, which is the outsourcing of the Dutch government's humanitarian aid funding to the tune of 124 million euros a year. Not all of it goes to Electronic Intifada, I'm not saying that, but I am saying that a million here and a million there, 10 million, or actually 13 or 14 million, 10 million euros goes to an organization in Ramallah called the uh, NGO Development Center, which is funded by five European governments. So a great deal of this money, it doesn't come from Saudi Arabia, it doesn't come from terrorist organizations as sometimes claimed, it comes from European democratic governments under the rubric or the, the uh, facade of promoting human rights or promoting humanitarian assistance. And it has for many years, at least 10 years, been abused in this way because of the lack of transparency, the lack of due process, and the ability of these organizations to work the system with a lot of their friends and colleagues. The flotilla, which I won't get into, is, a, is another example where there are a number of the organizations actually are indirectly and in some cases directly funded through some of these European groups, including uh, what's called the Israel Committee Against House Demolitions, Jeff Halper, who's one of the spokespeople for the flotilla and is largely funded by a number of European governments for something entirely different. The posters speak for themselves. The goal is not to make Israel change its policies. It is not to end the occupation. It is to end Israel's colonization and system of apartheid, as was articulated by the main organization that promotes the, the, B, the BDS process. 
And it is really, as I said, goes back to 1947. We don't want Israel here. And under any circumstances, this is another form of warfare. In conclusion, there are a couple of points I want to make that I think are essential. And it, it, I think it reflects a lot of what we've heard from here and from others. We have to take back the vocabulary, the, the principles, the underlying moral themes of human rights, international law. The fact that none of these organizations have invested anything more than lip service in the case of Gilad Shalit is fundamentally immoral. Not only do government human rights frameworks ignore Gilad Shalit, but this entire international mechanism, Amnesty Human Rights Watch, when they have put out an occasional statement, many of them for the first time just last week in five years, it's a fire and forget. They say, make a statement, there's no press conference, there's no follow-up, and in many cases, there's not even a recommendation that he be freed or demand that he be freed immediately. So these organizations have largely dropped the ball because this is not on their agenda. They have been kidnapped or they have kidnapped, hijacked the human rights agenda for ideological political purposes. It's absolutely necessary to restore the moral foundations and universality to human rights, to follow the money where it is being diverted and to raise those with the people, particularly government officials responsible for that. Naming and shaming is essential. Human Rights Watch, when its founder, Robert Bernstein, confronted with the evidence that we had put together, realized that the organization he had created, which was the number one organization to promote human rights in the world, was violating those principles. He broke in the New York Times, he wrote a very, I would say, very emotional and very poignant op-ed article in the New York Times saying this is not the organization. They have lost the moral compass that I thought they had. And he's been giving speeches at universities about that since then at the age of 88, which shows you how fired up he is. And I think it's also essential that we build alliances with the real victims of human rights abuses around the world. They are also being shortchanged. When so much attention and effort and resources are focused on obsession about Israel and allegations against Israel, then you have all the other groups in the world, the Dalits in, in India, Roma, and many other peoples in many other parts of the world who are suffering from human rights abuses, their cause is neglected. Tibet doesn't even come up. It's not on the agenda because you don't want to offend human, the, the, the governments of China. Just as a short example of something that we can do by through this process, going to the governments that promote this in, in parliaments, having hearings, and it comes out and it has a big difference. I know there are a lot of people here from Latin America where, as far as we know, they, the governments are not funding these groups, but they often see them as watchdogs, consult with them, and I think the same questions need to be raised. Those are often the sources, including in the media. Finally, I encourage you to look at our website or to speak with us. We've got two of our outstanding uh, colleagues in the back who can help with that, including our, our Spanish speaker, uh, Paula, and our communications director, Jason. We maintain a very active website. I know many of you have been in contact with us. We monitor in detail 150 organizations and uh, most of the funding frameworks for that. It's a very short process that I've had to, to be able to, to present this information. There's a lot more. I want to end with the point that was made about the battle of ideas. This is about a battle of ideas. It's about soft power being abused. But fundamentally, it's also about the amount of money, the huge resources that are available to take these very distorted concepts and put them out as dominant and make them the main themes that we see in campuses and in the human rights realm, and I think that that puts before us a very major challenge, which I do think we can meet. Thank you very much.